Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to see all of you here this morning. It is really good to see Jerry and Kelly and the Gas family here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, we're going to have a brief prayer period after the sermon today, just to come up here, gather around our teachers for the new trimester that is upcoming next Sunday, and just pray for them and for our children here at the Canyon Church. We're very much looking forward to the good things that are happening this summer, and uh, I hope that you will join with us on Saturday morning at 7 to 9 to pray together. It's just nothing like two hours of prayer with your brothers and sisters together. Today, turn to John, the 20th chapter, and we will be looking at the resurrection. And you might be thinking, wow, Mark, it was just Easter a few weeks ago. We looked at the resurrection then. Well, we celebrated it at that time. So today's lesson is going to be much like what last week's lesson was. There are so many different ways for us to view the cross. But we viewed it from the perspective of the prophecies that John gave us that were fulfilled, seven of them, on the cross. Today, I want to do the same thing because remember the goal of the Gospel of John is to bring about belief in Jesus as the Messiah. So we're going to look at the evidences for the resurrection. And you just might be thinking, well, I just accept it. Well, there are many in the world who do not accept the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some people say that he swooned. <laughs> we, they, they actually call it the swoon theory. If you don't know what swooned means, he passed out on the cross. He just looked like he was dead. Then he was put into the tomb with that big huge stone rolled over it and that he woke up, he revived, he pulled off all of the dressings that were on him, the burial clothes, etc. And he then moved the stone away and somehow got away from the guards that were there, the Roman guards that had been set there. Another, um, another theory about Jesus is that he wasn't really physical. <laughs> he, he was kind of ghost-like, and he was a spirit. A and so you can't really kill a spirit. So he really didn't die, and he wasn't really raised. And then the other one, which is the most popular one, is the one that the Jews, the chief priests started in his day, which is the disciples stole the body. And so we're going to look at a few of these things today. We're going to look at the compelling evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is the single most important event in Christian history without a doubt. Everything in Christianity depends upon this event. If this event did not happen, if the disciples stole the body, or any other plot by them to subvert the truth of what actually happened, if Jesus simply swooned on the cross and was not dead, then revived and left the tomb and pretended to be risen, if the disciples made up the resurrection for whatever reason, then all of Christianity collapses. And Paul makes that abundantly clear in 1 Corinthians 15 chapter. Always remember 1 Corinthians 15. Talks about the resurrection. Talks about what's going to happen to us when we're raised. Well, there were certain individuals at Corinth that were saying, there's no resurrection. And that was a very Greek thing to do in a very Greek city. They didn't believe in the resurrection at all. No Greeks actually, if they were, you know, entrenched in their mythology, believed in a bodily resurrection. And so there, there was some teaching going on at Corinth that that wasn't going to happen. And Paul makes a beautiful statement about that. He says this, Now if Christ is preached 
that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is also in vain. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if, in fact, the dead are not raised. I'm going to stop right there and just say this is reasoning from one point to another. He goes to the end results and says, let me tell you how ridiculous this doctrine is that you're believing. If you tell everyone they're not going to raise from the dead, then that means Christ did not raise from the dead. That means we're false witnesses. That means we actually witnessed against God this stuff. So, he says, For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. Have I forgotten to move this? Yeah, I think I did. Excuse me. All right. For if the dead is not raised, even Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep, that's just an ancient way of saying they died, in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ only in this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. And then verse 32 is the one that I love to read. And the reason why I love to read it, because I've heard people say before, well, if, you know, Christ was really not raised from the dead, I I know, I know that I would still be, you know, you know, a great person that I am. Baloney. And Paul said basically the same thing. If from human motives I fought the wild beast, the wild beast it refers to people who wanted to drag him into the theater and kill him in Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Get the most out of this life while you're living it. It's a ridiculous notion to live life without the resurrection of Jesus. Let's read John's account of the resurrection in just a moment. And and I I want you to just think of this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ either happened or it did not. It's either a fabrication or it is the truth. If it is a fabrication, it is the greatest worldwide deception on a scale that is historically singular. No one has deceived more people if the resurrection is not the truth. You cannot rightfully and mentally say that you are in your right mind to accept a doctrine or explanation in the middle of those two polar opposites. You cannot stand in the middle. He he either was raised from the dead or he was not raised from the dead. And there's no doctrine in the middle that makes any sense whatsoever to anyone. This sermon, then, is very much like the sermon that we did last week. It's going to be about so that we might believe. John, I maintain, has the same goal in mind when he gives us an account of the resurrection, and that's why his account of the resurrection is slightly different. Now, let's read the account of the resurrection. And I'll read it out of the New American Standard Version in my Bible, and I'm hoping that it's the same one up there. We'll just see how that goes, okay? That's supposed to be a New American Standard up there. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away. 
So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Now, Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb and saw the linen wrappings lying there, And the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple, who had first come to the tomb, then also entered, and he saw and believed. But as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again, to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping, and so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener she said to him sir if you have carried him away tell me where you have laid him and i will take him away jesus said to her mary she turned and said to him in hebrew rabboni which means teacher jesus said to her Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and to your Father, and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he said these things to her. So when it was evening, now I just want to interject, that's the same day. When that evening, this is morning that Mary saw this, that evening. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were, were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his feet. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, that word means twin. Thomas was a twin, okay? Was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples <clears throat> excuse me, were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came. 
the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here with your, your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. And then John writes this, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, or Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. I want us to look at four evidences. There are many more, but we only have time for four evidences today that Jesus truly did raise from the dead. And the first one is this, and it's, it's going to sound quite odd to a whole bunch of us who live in the 21st century in America, okay? The appearance was to women first. Now, let's, let's go back in our minds. What if it's all a story the disciples made up? What if it's a complete fabrication, okay? Women in the Roman Greco world were not allowed to be witnesses in a court of law. Now that might really hurt some of you, okay? I'm just telling you what was. I don't believe it ought to be, but that's what was. Women in the Jewish justice system were not allowed to be witnesses. If this is a fabrication of the disciples, why on earth would they say, and every single one of the gospel writers write, that it was women who first saw the resurrected Lord and it was women who went to the others who were men and told them. And other gospel writers say that the other disciples looked at them and thought they were telling tales. It's quite... It, it, that would be the last first witnesses that anybody would write down if it's a fabrication. And I think that's what we have to think sometimes. All right, then what would, I mean, if it is not the truth, then what would be happening? Well, that would not be happening. Secondly, <clears throat> the burial dressings and the face cloth. I mean, that, that's pretty interesting there to me. Yeah, because John is very clear about that. The burial dressings were all set aside in one place, the face cloth was rolled up and folded in another place. In other words, there, there was not a mess on the burial slab. Okay, and you say, well, that Jesus, he sure is a neat freak, isn't he? You know, that, that's not the point. That's the point. The point is, okay, what if somebody stole him? What, what if Jesus revived? Why? Why would he put the burial clothing all lined up carefully? Why would the disciples, if they stole the body, now listen, this is what they're going to have to do. They're going to have to sneak up on the soldiers, hope that they're asleep, and remember, if a Roman soldier loses a prisoner, especially a dead one, they're going to be executed summarily. No questions asked. They cannot lose a prisoner. So that means the soldiers had to fall asleep. The disciples go in. <clears throat> As the disciples go in, they have to move a stone without waking the soldiers. When they get in, they have to unwrap the body. And then they're going to nicely, neatly put it back and then they're going to leave with a body without the soldiers seeing it. <clears throat> you might then be asking, well, 
Why were the clothes that way? I think it's Jesus' way to show evidence that he just came out of the burial clothing and the face cloth and they stayed right where they were supposed to stay. You can think other things, but it is ridiculous to think that anyone would fold them up. Thirdly, Jesus' appearance to the disciples or apostles who did not believe in the resurrection and did not accept the eyewitness account of Mary. And by the way, Mary was with other people. John even says that she was with other women. Other gospel writers tell us there were other women at that time. <clears throat> there is not one of these disciples or apostles, as we now call them, who later defected, retracted, or denounced his faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Now, I I'm going to tell you something. If Jesus did get up and take off on his own, a half-dead, staggering, sick man who had just had a narrow escape with the most powerful nation on earth is not going to be worshipped fearlessly as divine Lord and conqueror of death. That's not going to happen by the disciples. And by the way, there have been other instances like this in religion. And I will note the Mormon religion. Joseph Smith said he has witnesses. Joseph Smith said he had three very important witnesses that saw him with the golden plates. Okay? And that's very, very important. But I'm going to quote to you something out of their own website, which is churchofjesuschrist.org, that they say, I am not writing this. They said it. John Whitmer, that's one of the three, <clears throat> was later excommunicated on the March 10th, 1838 for taking personal title to church property. David Whitmer, that's the second one, was excommunicated one, late, one month later for apostasy. Oliver Cowdery, that's the third one, was excommunicated about the same time for dishonesty, especially lying about Joseph Smith. This is from their own website. In contrast to that account, according to several 1st and 2nd century documents, all the apostles were executed for their faith in Jesus as the Messiah King, except for John, who was exiled to a desolate island called Patmos. Peter went to his death in crucifixion upside down under Nero, and that was by his request because he didn't think he could dishonor Christ by being straight up. The 13th apostle, Paul, was executed by Nero as well, but by beheading since he was a Roman citizen. Now I want you to think about Paul. Because he was not there in the beginning. He was Saul. He was Saul the persecutor. Okay. This Saul was a rising star in Judaism who had been schooled under one of the greatest rabbis that Judaism has ever known, Gamaliel. He was violently persecuting the church by his own admission and by orders from the Sanhedrin council and he suddenly converted on the way to persecute people. Suddenly converted. Why? He lost his name. He lost his credentials, his wealth, his association and camaraderie with the other Jewish leadership and became a marked man who suffered persecution by those he had once been a vital member of. Again, why? There is no plausible explanation for such except that Paul saw Jesus as the risen Savior. He had visited him in a vision and he called him personally to follow him. No apostle has ever been impugned for immoral, devious, unscrupulous behavior. None. Ever. If they made up the story, 
and stole the body. Are you telling me that inevitably they wouldn't have followed up that deception by selfishly pursuing something? What did they get out of saying the words that Jesus is the Messiah? Finally, Jesus' appearance to Thomas. Now remember, <clears throat> eyewitnesses come to the disciples. They say, we don't believe you. <laughs> but then Jesus showed up. Okay. Then eyewitnesses tell Thomas, and he doesn't believe. And so what happens? Jesus shows up. Thomas is the one who said, I'm demanding physical evidence. Jesus gladly gave it to him. He did not say, well, you're not going to get that, Thomas. You didn't believe? No, no, no. This is where Jesus is making the point that he is the Christ. When he refused to believe 10 eyewitness testimonies of colleagues with whom he had spent over three years, Jesus, I'm telling you, he could not have been some sort of spirit because Thomas wouldn't have believed. He would have, he would have gone, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're not physical. Now, I know that Jesus could cloak his physical appearance. Maybe Mary saw him. I don't know. Maybe she was crying so much she couldn't recognize him as Jesus. She spent three and a half years with him. Okay, I, I think she would have recognized him. I just don't think that she either looked up when she heard the voice of, of Jesus at the beginning, but he, I think Jesus did that purposely. He purposely cloaked what he looked like to people because there were other times when that happened. You get to chapter 21 and there's this guy on the shore and the disciples are out there fishing and they look and they don't know it's him <laughs> until they say, until the man on the shore says, throw in the nets. And then they catch so much fish they can't pull it in. And John says, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. And Peter goes, get on my clothes, jump in the water, and go see him. Okay, and then by the way, remember what the Lord's doing on the shore? He's making them a meal, a bread and fish, and he eats with them. It doesn't, there's no sense in which a spirit does that. The disciples were invited Thomas is invited to look, feel, touch the evidence. And sometimes I think even Christians say, well, what's the big deal of the physical body? Uh, you know, what, whether he's a spirit or not, you know, what's the big deal? The big deal is this. It wasn't real blood. And God demands blood as a sacrifice. Jesus died physically. As he says in Revelation of himself, I became dead and now I'm alive forevermore. If ever there was a group of people <clears throat> who wanted desperately to produce the body of Jesus Christ and stop the spread of the doctrine that he was actually the Messiah, it would have been the chief priest and the Pharisees who called for his execution, but they could not do it. Not even in the face of Peter and the rest of the disciples on the day of Pentecost, preaching out only 50 days after his execution. Only 50 days. Hey, that man that you killed, he's... A risen. We're eyewitnesses of it. Why wouldn't they just go get the body and say, Doop. no, he's not. <laughs> they couldn't. They had no body. And so in the face of all that, Peter and those disciples say, that Jesus of Nazareth is up in heaven. He is sitting at the right hand of God. He is reigning. He is the Messiah King, and you killed him. Wow. I, I'm telling you, the resurrection proves 
everything that John wrote in chapter 1. It proves that Jesus is the eternal word in the flesh, incarnate in order to give us life and light to mankind. It proves he is God on equality with the Father. It proves that he has the power and right to give new birth to people who are sinners. It proves through the eyewitness testimony of John, the gospel writer, and so many others, that he was the full manifestation of God in a fleshly form full of grace and truth. He was the fullness of the Godhead. And it proves that Jesus is the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And when John the Baptist pointed him out, and John the gospel writer writes down that, it proves that he is all those things. <clears throat> but one more thing. There's one more chapter. And they say, oh no, another lesson next week. It compels us. It proves a lot of things. But that proof compels us to make a decision, a decision in regard to mission. And we're going to look at that next week. We're going to look at the community mission and we're going to look at the personal mission that each of us has. We're going to look at Simon Peter and how the Lord gently restored him. But we're also going to look at what Jesus calls his disciples to do.